Hey, hello everyone and welcome to this session where we want to talk a little bit more about how to build a smart and faster business, specifically using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And today I want to talk you through a little bit on some examples that we see from an Amazon perspective, but also different customers that we have and dive a little bit into the platform and some of the things that you can actually use to build your own machine learning models on top of a cloud computing platform, specifically AWS. My name is Oliver Klein and I'm the Chief Technologist for AWS here in Asia Pacific. And I hope that in the future again we hopefully can do some of these conferences again in person. Unfortunately this time I got to come virtual to you. Now the first thing that I always like to look at is, well, why do we do certain things in the technology space? Well, we do it to achieve a variety of different business goals. And that's really what we always want to work backwards from. So that can be, I want to grow new revenue streams for my company, maybe improve my operations, have better operational efficiencies, and with that potentially have cost savings. And of course, generally I also want to look at how can I lower my business risk. And all of these things can be achieved with the help of data and of course with machine learning. However, there are a variety of different, different challenges that we have here in, in this uh, specific regard. The first one, we have more and more data that is being aggregated and it just keeps increasing over time. Data uh, is stored in a variety of different types, you know, from, from unstructured to semi-structured data to complete new formats like blob formats, like video formats or audio files that we need to just transcribe and put into our AI machine learning. Uh, on top of that, very often that data sits potentially in silos. So you might have it in different units or different parts within your business. The other thing is really about the challenges that we see around, you know, data analytics and machine learning skills, specifically how can we, you know, make sure that we have the latest and greatest tools and frameworks and that we have people ten, can actually make use of these tools or frameworks as such. And then lastly, of course, we want to make sure that whatever data that we're storing, that we comply with the uh, with the local privacy laws that we make sure that the data that we're having is securely stored and that we are compliant with any kind of regulations. What that then for us means is that we generally got to um, develop a certain data strategy. Um, very often I refer to this as a, a modern data strategy. So instead of having the traditional model of having some uh, you know, big kind of data warehouse appliance that I have sitting somewhere uh, in a data center, cloud computing now allows me to store data very much more efficiently. First, we can decouple compute and storage. Uh, storage can grow infinitely large in different kind of formats. But to do that, we first got to look into how can we modernize our data infrastructure. And that means I need to build my data assets on top of a data lake uh, infrastructure that sits on top of a cloud computing platform. Um, if you use AWS, you get the benefit that, it is, that you work with some of the most scalable and trusted cloud provider out there. Now, the next thing that you can do is, is you generally don't end up with just one single data lake, but you end up with you know, many different data puddles, you could see it, many different places. And that's okay. Um, th that doesn't necessarily mean that we create a lot of different data silos because with these new techniques and tools that we have available and the scalability of cloud computing, we can say we can unify you know, a variety of different data sources together. Uh, we might have certain purpose-built databases you know, from maybe the more traditional SQL Server Oracle databases or any relational databases to some of the newer ones like you know, Cassandra or DynamoDB or MongoDB or, or different like time series databases. We can grab from all these data sources and unify that together to you know, do things like data analytics, but also feed machine learning models. And, and this is really where we can start innovating. And that's what I want to talk about next is how can we you now reimagine kind of the customer experiences that we have with the help of AI and machine learning on top of that new data strategy. And if you follow a variety of different uh, research companies like IDC or Gartner or Lloyd, we can see that there's a, a, a really a trend of machine learning and AI becoming commonplace in pretty much every company. Actually, IDC um, estimates that by 2024, the, sorry, 2024, the global spending on AI is probably going to reach 110 U billion US dollars. Gartner, for example, is also looking into, well, what do they predict in terms of piloting to from piloting like quickly trying machine learning model to really operationalizing it and they believe that by the end of 2024 75% of all the enterprise 
uh, companies out there will have shifted completely from right now they might just be trying things out machine learning and by then they really operationalize AI pretty much into the entire company and Deloitte is also looking at you know how AI is really transforming over the, the next three years now if we think a bit about the, the business outcomes and business impacts that I was talking about earlier, if we take machine learning, well, what are some of the things that you can actually do with AI and machine learning? The first one, pretty obvious, right? I want to optimize my business because I want to have better efficiency. I want to run my company more efficient. I want to do better forecasting, etc. I want to do smarter or better or faster decision making, right? I want to maybe want to reroute a package. I'm going to give you a few examples with Amazon Logistics a little bit later. You know, how can we make this decision better? The other thing is really about, can I add new capabilities to my products, right? Can I, you know, enrich and improve my customer experience by personalizing the experience, by having new channels using natural voice or computer vision or other deeper experiences that you can create uh, for, for your customer. And lastly, of course, we might even end up completely inventing net new products. Not too long ago, uh, you know, speaking through a smart speaker or computer system was complete science fiction. Um, by now we have, you know, devices like the Amazon Echo speaker with the Alexa voice services or other, other smart speakers out there. And we just take it for granted that we have these new products. Well, AI and machine learning helps us again to potentially create a lot more of these products. And you can see that um, across, if you look at some of uh, the customers that build on top of, of AWS with their machine learning AI capabilities. Take, for example, Intuit. Intuit is looking into how can they use natural language processing model, transcribe voice conversation for the entire call center and call center agent to number one, enrich the experience for the customer and the call center agent themselves, but also use these new, um, these new formats and this new information that they get through the AI models to really improve the customer experience. Take for example, Lyft, which is a ride sharing company um, in, in, uh, primarily in the US, I think. Um, but they work, for example, with Level 5, which is building uh, a variety of different self-driving car abilities. So again, we're looking into complete net new products. You know, how can we build a self-driving car, at least, you know, reduce, for example, uh, the, the, the amount of human input that we need when we need to uh, go from point A to point B. Cerna, which is uh, operating in the healthcare space, they're looking into how can they use, you know, data points to potentially predict diseases before they happen. Specifically, they're looking at uh, cardiovascular diseases. So with these new AI deep learning models that they created, they can predict 50 months earlier certain risks that they couldn't do beforehand. And even in the, the sports space, if you follow, for example, the National Football League in the US, NFL, uh, you might have heard of the AWS Next Gen Stats, which is basically stat statistics that calculate, you know, what are the probabilities of someone, you know, having a certain pass, et cetera. And all of that comes from computer vision again, which is AI models and also sensory data and helmets, et cetera. So a good combination you know, of data lake in real time stream data, running it to a machine learning model, taking other unstructured data like computer vision, running it to a machine learning model, and then creating a better viewer experience out here. Same thing goes for Amazon. We have a long history of using machine learning models and AI. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at Amazon.com, over 4,000 products are sold, are sold per minute on just Amazon.com alone. And a lot of this requires complete machine learning models, right? We have about 1.6 billion packages that are being sent out every day. And uh, again, I will show you a video in just a, a little bit to show you how we optimize you know, some of the fulfillment center work that we're doing and how machine learning is being used there. I already talked about, you know, voice services, Alexa voice services and smart speakers, billions of Alexa interactions that we have now every week. You know, not too long ago, this was a complete new product. Um, and we also have things like uh, Prime Air, which does drone deliveries completely autonomous. So a drone that can maneuver packages maybe from one fulfillment center to the next um, completely by itself. The first delivery that we've done there, that's already back in 2016 now. And all of this is requiring, of course, data, but a lot of machine learning. Now, let's have a look at the following. Here you can see a video of one of our fulfillment centers in the US. And this is the A side of the building. There's also a B side of the building. So you can imagine the scale and the size of these fulfillment centers because this only shows you half of that one fulfillment center. Um, but the one interesting thing that you probably notice here in the video is that the picking process is actually done by robots. So this is, is coming out of the Amazon robotics department. 
those little robots that drive under the shelf, lift up the shelf and bring it to the packing station. We do this for two reasons. Yeah, the first one is obvious. Uh, you know, obviously that this, this picking process is being automated, which allows us to potentially improve the picking time. I mean, reduce the picking time. But the actual, and that's the second, which is the main reason for us, it actually allows us to reduce the cost of space that we're using on how we actually store this product. Why? Well, if you look at these shelves, they can actually move very close together and we can stack and pack you know, all these products into these different shelves very closely to each other, which allows us to reduce the cost of actually storing goods, which allows us to pass these savings on, on to end customers. Now, the next thing that you're obviously gonna think about is as well, how do these robots know where is what stored and how do we actually fill up these shelves? And that's obviously a big data problem. And again, here we use things such as computer vision to actually, number one, identify empty space in these bins and the shelves, um, but also we can detect object misplacements because the one thing you wanna make sure is, is that if your database, database says in this shelf, in this specific bin, I have, a, you know, I have this product, we also wanna make sure that that product is actually there. When, that, uh, when that, uh, the robot drives this shelf to the packing station, there's generally still, uh, most of the time, it's certainly a human FC associate that takes it in and out. Sometimes there's an error that happens. Maybe you grab the wrong product, you put it back into the wrong bin. Computer vision here again allows us to understand has the right product been picked, but also understand the empty space that we still have and based on that really optimize on how we store goods so we can pack them up to the maximum of the space that we have in. Also, if you look at the supply chain, itself, we automate them fully end to end. Again, using machine learning models, specifically deep learning AI models that do forecasting. Forecasting that, by the way, anyone can now use to AWS, but I'm gonna get that to that in a little bit later. We do demand forecasting for over 400 million products daily. And here's the interesting thing, based on these forecasts, we can then understand what's our capacity, should we buy, uh, procure these products and where do we then place them in which fulfillment centers. Over 99% of our entire inventory is completely automatically ordered with the help of these machine learning and forecasting models. All right, so there's no human intervention of I, I need to buy uh, some of these products. It's completely done automatically. Also, if you look at um, within the fulfillment center, take for example these conveyor belts, Again, you probably heard of predictive maintenance that is being very useful in the industrial space. We do exactly the same thing here. So all the conveyor belts are equipped with a lot of sensor technology. Uh, that te sensor technology then allows us to understand, you know, what's the flow of these packages. But more importantly, we can also do things such as predictive maintenance. We can uh, see if there's any problem, any of these motors that might break down. If it, before it breaks down, if we predict it, we can fix it before it happens. But here's the more interesting thing. We also do something we call SLAM, scan, label, apply, and manifest, which allows us to basically decide the carrier and the route on how we ship a package out uh, at the last station right before we send it out. We really, it's just in time. So we weigh the package after everything has been packed, we weigh the package, and then we have a machine learning model that looks at all the current carriers and predicts what is the most cost-effective and fastest way, because these things can change pretty much every second. And then that very moment, we only decide which carrier we're taking and label and manifest the package and off it goes. So again, a good example of using, you know, in real time data knowledge that we have together with machine learning to make better decisions. Now I also said you can create complete new products. I talked about the Amazon Echo speaker earlier, but you might have heard of Amazon Go. Now, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically a store where you can just walk in, you scan yourself in once with your phone and a QR code, and the door opens up, and then you can take off the shelves whatever you want. You can put it straight in your bag, you can straight consume it, maybe eat it, drink it, whatever. And when you walk out, we just automatically charge you based on what you took off the shelves. So no cashier, you don't need to wait in any line, you don't need to swipe any credit card or what have you. Uh, you just walk in, you take off the shelves what you want, walk out, that's it, end of story. How do we do that? Well, we actually do a combination of both sensor fusion technology and of course, computer vision. So AI and machine learning is being used here. If you ever have the chance to go into one of these stores, um, look up into the ceiling and you'll see lots of cameras basically hanging uh, uh, in that ceiling. Now these cameras basically record any activity within the store and that allows us to then decide what you actually picked off the shelf and who we need to charge for that product. 
Um, what you see here is an actual uh, video footage of one of these stitched together cameras that runs through our computer vision system. So the top part here shows our first store in Seattle. Uh, you can see that we actually anonymize, of course, who that person is. So it's not that we track the individual person, you an anonymize the identifier. But you can see basically there's the entire movement in that store can be verified or basically tracked by all these cameras. And that allows us then later to run our algorithms on top of it and understand what did you take off the shelves. And on the bottom part, you both see a, com a, um, a computer vision model that allows us to understand who actually grabbed something from, uh, from a shelf. And you can see how specific that computer vision model is. And also on the left hand side, you actually see a simulation. So one of the things to train this computer vision model is we're obviously going to use actual real footage of people, you know, um, going into the store and doing certain things. But very often that is not enough. So we also create 3D simulations and use that also to further train our computer vision model with more and more use cases over time. And of course, we improve the computer vision model over time. Which brings me now to the machine learning journey itself. So if you think about if you want to launch into the machine learning journey, what do you need to do? Well, first, you really got to think about how do I remove my undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? Don't think about racking and stacking servers and creating your own kind of data lake. Look at modern data strategies and what's available with AWS or other cloud providers out there. Uh, get your data then in order, you know, understand where you can apply machine learning and that should always be driven by uh, business outcomes. Then you're going to look into what frameworks can I use? How can I develop my team to potentially uh, uh, do that? And then of course, champion your machine learning culture. So if you want to get started with your machine learning journey, the first thing I would always look at is what is my data strategy? Now, hopefully you already have a, a wonderful modern data strategy. If you don't have, you first want to lay that foundation, a good foundation of data lake capabilities, you know, purpose-built data stores and ways to unify different data sources, have structured, semi-structured data, etc., that you can basically train your models on. From there, you then want to start uh, from a business challenge. So think about what kind of uh, business challenge do I have? What kind of outcome? Do I want to drive and based on that, you can then start building out the machine learning model. And the other thing that I would say is, is we got great services, we got great frameworks, and I'm going to talk about that in just a bit. Um, but also look into are there maybe partners that could potentially help you with training or with other programs or with, <coughs> excuse me, with enabling you on machine learning or build the machine learning models for you. So there are many different ways to help you along the way. And uh, for me, then the next kind of steps for your machine learning journey is generally you look at, well, what are some of these horizontal use cases? Are there scenarios where I can just take an API that AWS or other partner provides that can easily add intelligence to any of my application? Or do I look more into like vertical specific solutions? So in AWS, we invest in two specific industry specific services, you know, in the computer vision space, healthcare space, others. So have a look what we got there. Um, but if none of that applies, then you probably want to end up building your own machine learning models through what we call our Amazon SageMaker platform that allows you to really build, train and deploy your machine learning models potentially with pre-built and existing machine learning algorithms on top of your own data, but with pre-built algorithms. I'm going to dive into that a little bit more in just a bit. Now, from an AWS perspective here, um, we basically look at it, um, you know, multi-layer kind of stack. I mean, that top stack, as I mentioned, is pretty much solutions that are built for specific experience, for, for specific industries, right? So how do I um, have personalization capabilities? You can get access to the same personalization recommendation engine that Amazon.com is using, but without having any machine learning expertise. It's just an API uh, that you can connect with. You can load up your metadata and your data sets, and off you go, you have your own recommendation and personalization engine. Uh, there are different ways of, for example, intelligent contact sensors, the entire solutions that we have, or media intelligence, maybe in the media and entertainment business. Um, there are ways to optimize your business, right? Intelligent search capabilities, fraud detection capabilities. Again, you can get access to the same fraud detection engine that Amazon.com is using uh, with Amazon Fraud Detector, but again, you just implement it with an API. Intelligent document processing, very important if you have you know, different kind of documents lying around, you need to process them, extract information out. Um, sometimes metrics analysis. 
any kind of metrics that you store are always useful to run machine learning models on top of it. We got solutions that allow you to do that straight away and find outliers. Based on that, I can improve my business. To a certain extent, this is even useful for software development with Amazon Code Guru. You can accelerate your software development, find bugs, find problems, find performance problem. And like I said, also industry specific solutions, where again, we keep expanding uh, this footprint. If we currently don't support industry, let us know. We always want to build these things out. So in healthcare and life sciences, many different ways of doing things like transcription, comprehension of different medical terms and you know different things that have been talked about, intelligent data lakes that are compliant for health for the healthcare space or the industrial and manufacturing space. So predictive maintenance capabilities and also things such as quality inspections and even computer vision at the edge on existing CCTV cameras that you might be having hanging around the IPTV cameras. The, set, the, the layer below then is other AI services. So services such as computer vision services with Amazon recognition, speech service, chatbot capabilities, textual, natural language uh, processing capabilities, which are now building blocks that you can put into your application without the need to train any of these machine learning models yourself. Then below really comes the machine learning platform. That's really where the Amazon SageMaker platform sits. So that allows you to, to label your data, collect, store the features, etc., train, pick your algorithm, train it. I'm gonna talk about this in just a bit in, in more detail. And lastly, of course, the different kind of frameworks and the underlying infrastructure to both train your machine learning models, but of course, um, also looking into uh, uh, what, what are the underlying infrastructure on which we infer a machine learning model, um, uh, machine learning algorithms on top of it. Again, we are agnostic in terms of the frameworks that you use, so it's not just the ones listed here of uh, MXNet, TensorFlow, PyTorch. You can use any of the frameworks out there. Uh, we optimize for a variety of different frameworks, and of course, we also optimize the underlying infrastructure. And I'm going to get to that in just a bit. But let's say, for example, just these AI services. That's really easy way to add intelligence to your existing applications without the need to learn any machine learning uh, skills. So that's around computer vision, chatbots, different business tools, speech, text, contact center capabilities, um, you know, improving ways of how you run your DevOps metrics, you know, healthcare, etc. I talked about this. So this is always the way to start. Look at can these tools help me? These are just services that I can use. I can easily implement them into my application. What if that's not the case? Well, then maybe I want to build my own machine learning model. And this is really where Amazon SageMaker comes in. So the entire SageMaker Studio IDE covers the entire life cycle of a machine learning model. So that means I'm going to pick my algorithm and I can choose from inbuilt algorithms that are available, or even our entire partner network, uh, where you get access to specific um, algorithms that have been built by our partners that you can use. And you can look into how do I label my data? How do I train my models? How do I optimize that? How do I prepare my data? How do I tune maybe the parameters to optimize machine learning algorithm over time? Uh, based on labeling or tra training that data, I might also create what is called features that I can reuse for other machine learning models. So I can store these features and then of course deploy uh, into production, check if my model is working well, is there any bias, do we have any drift on my model, uh, so we want to manage and monitor that. Of course, we also have capabilities about visualizing everything in notebooks, generally, for example, Jupyter notebooks are probably the most common ones, we support a variety of them, and of course, also support CI/CD capabilities, so that you constantly can basically, you know, roll out new versions of your machine learning model, improve it over time, do things such as A-B testing, etc. How does that all work with something like SageMaker? Well, like I said, prepare, build, train, tune, deploy, and manage your machine learning models. And here you see the specific capabilities that you can now get. The first one is, what if I need to label my data for training? SageMaker Ground Truth can help me label my training data, even with the help of machine learning. So basically it tries to automatically label things that it already knows, and if it doesn't, then you can uh, have a human annotation and it will again learn over time there. Uh, you can also aggregate and prepare your data with thing, things such as the data wrangler. Uh, with SageMaker processing, you can also do pre-processing with, you know, uh, a, with Spark scripts or your, your own built-in Python script, etc. And like I said, you also have a feature store. So if you label certain 
data before, then you can say, now I have a feature that I can reuse for other machine learning models too. And with the feature store, I can basically store update and retrieve and share these features across all my different machine learning models. When I build it then now, generally we want to rely on potential notebooks. We want to, like I said, then choose an algorithm. It's either way a built-in algorithm that we provide uh, from an Amazon perspective or to our APN partner network. Or, of course, you can obviously also build your own algorithm if you, if you want to do so. Um, again, we have capabilities also to do some of the local testing, maybe on the local machine before you actually deploy it out to a cloud. And the other interesting thing is there's also an autopilot functionality. So if you say, I just want to, you know, I don't really know what machine learning model to use here. Just go and autopilot this out for me. Here's the data. Uh, SageMaker basically goes ahead, looks at the data sets, and then tries to find the optimal, excuse me, <clears throat> the optimal uh, kind of algorithm um, completely on autopilot mode. From there, of course, when we train our machine learning models, again, we want to tune that machine learning model over time. So first things first, with one click of a button, we can launch a distributed cluster of an infrastructure to train my machine learning model really quickly. But then I can start experimenting and say, what if I change some parameters around with things like SageMaker experiments? I can capture and organize every of my experiments uh, by every step. And based on that, I can decide maybe what way or what version works better for me. And again, that's important because no machine learning model is perfect. Certainly not the first iteration very often. So you always want to kind of want to experiment and improve over time. Now we do have some automatic model tuning capabilities here. So that means I can optimize my different hyperparameters. So these, especially deep learning machine learning models, um, generally always have a variety of different hyperparameters. Depending what you set them, you know the model performs better or worse. This is a way of basically trying out to change these parameters around and then find out what is the best parameter for to, to really improve my model. Of course, it comes with a debugger, so you can debug all your training runs and see what's, what's going wrong, where you maybe want to improve it. And then the other interesting thing is you can also train with um, what we call spot instances. So spot instances is basically the ability uh, to say I bid for a certain amount of capacity at a price that I, that I say I'm willing to pay 10 cents for your biggest GPUs, 1 cent, whatever. And depending on demand and supply, we actually have a market trade, which very often is up to 90% cheaper than the actual uh, on-demand capacity. So what you can do is say, I'm just going to bid on this specific price. When it's available at that price, go and train my machine learning model. And I can reduce cost up to 90%. And then, of course, with one click of a button, I can deploy it. I get an API endpoint with my now own built and trained machine learning model. Again, I can, uh, it's fully managed, you know, it can go down to ultra low latency, high throughput. You have a, a flexibility in how you do it. If you use something like Kubernetes or Kubeflow, there's integration for that. Um, very important, there's also the ability to have multi-model endpoints and I highly encourage that. So you can have multiple versions of your model and have multiple endpoints and send certain parts of your user base to a um, different kind of models. This is actually the way um, Amazon is doing it too. This is not only to roll out a new version, but we constantly want to test what performs better uh, on different users, on different models. So you can do that with multi-model endpoints. And of course, how do you model that? Well, you can use the model monitor of SageMaker so you understand what's my accuracy on my deployed models. And automate that entire thing. You know, the CI/CD pipeline is always good with SageMaker pipelines. We can really orchestrate and automate that entire workflow. And that's really an important thing. Uh, something like SageMaker is DevOps ready. And I always say start automating straight from day one. First things first, from a security perspective, a lot of security features uh, that we build in really help you to meet maybe some of your privacy laws or some of the compliance that you have around you know, HIPAA compliance or PCI compliance, etc. But you can create your own machine learning uh, workflows that are completely automated. Uh, you can always think about scalability in a cloud. Maybe you train at a very, very large cluster that then once the training is done, you actually shut it back down. Um, and that allows you to train on massive data centers, uh, sorry, data sets, I should say. And that uh, again is fully managed to SageMaker platform. So you can say, just scale it up when you're done training, shut it all down, so I start paying for it. And of course, all of that can be automatically scheduled based on events, based on timeframes you have complete flexibility on how to do that. Now, I talked a bit about training on the underlying infrastructure. Let's zoom into that just for a moment here. Um, because with AWS, you actually get access to the broadest and deepest amount of compute infrastructure specifically 
for artificial intelligence and machine learning. So you have a full flexible choice between a variety of different CPUs, GPUs, and even specific chipsets and accelerators that have been built just for deep learning capabilities. So if you look at some of the traditional machine learning, maybe you want to use some of the, the, the Skylake CPUs or the Intel Cascades. Uh, there's some accelerators, about so Gaudi, going to get to that in a bit. Maybe you train it on some AMD or whatever. But we also have our own chip sets with through the Annapurna Labs, which is an Amazon company where we create things such as the Graviton CPU, but also the Inferentia chip, which allows you to actually make uh, run machine learning inference as a fraction of a cost of some of our the other, um, the other uh, processing units that you would have. But if you go into the deep learning space, very often you also want to have GPU capabilities. So for inference, we have you know, things such as the INF1 instances, or you can get access to some of the latest and greatest NVIDIA GPUs, such as the A100. And let's just uh, have a quick look at these things. Like, for example, the Amazon EC2 P4D instance, which is the most powerful GPU instance in the cloud at this point in time. Um, we find that if you take an existing model, go to this latest uh, training capabilities, you can lower your cost up to 60% um, to train your machine learning models at a faster speed with more performance. This is with the help of the latest A100 NVIDIA GPUs, comes with eight of these GPUs, 400 gigabits of network, Bandwidth very important so you can actually talk between your nodes and is capable to do up to 2.5 of petaflops of performance. So that's really a really great way if I, if I would need to train very massive data set or extremely complicated computations that, um, that I want to run. And of course, scale, you can deploy it in multiple clusters. It can deploy it in what we call ultra clusters, you know, where we tightly couple these instances together so they can quickly talk to each other. Um, with, a, with the right network bandwidth to really allow you to um, train up to any kind of scale that you want to have. In a similar gist also, what um, about things such as deep learning instances? For example, take the Amazon EC2 DL1 instance. This is one of the instances that comes with the latest, newest Intel Habani Gaudi Accelerator. Right? So these instances comes with eight Gaudi accelerators, so again, this is a, a new way of potentially inferring and training uh, your machine learning models with a Habani Gaudi accelerator. We find that you get up to 40% better price performance than some of the latest GPU instances. So if you say, okay, actually I want to get a better, better cost performance here, maybe I can use a Habana Gaudi accelerator. Again, you obviously got to design, uh, design for it, uh, but generally um, it comes, if you integrate with TensorFlow or PyTorch, you know, Habani Gaudi Accelerator are compatible here. It's relatively easy to get started there. Then I also talked about the INF1 instances, right, which come with the Inferentia chip, a chip set that is specifically built um, by AWS for machine learning inference. And our idea is, is how can we cut the cost of machine learning inference? Because training is one thing, when you find that uh, the majority of cost very often comes from actually making predictions, inferring from a machine learning model. So in one instances here with the Infranchet chipset, the AWS Infranchet chipset is really built for that. Again, comes with the Nitro system. So you have uh, an Infranchet chipset, comes with uh, a Nitro system on top of an Intel processor, nice network ring that we can scale all the way out, which allows us to get high performance inference at a fraction of the cost. And now if you wonder how can I use this inferential chipset, because that's obviously not maybe what my usual framework is using, that is the reason we have something called the AWS Neuron SDK, which is a high performance software development kit that comes with a neuron compiler, neuron runtime and profiling tools, integrates with TensorFlow, MXNet and PyTorch. And what it then does is you take you know, your, your model that you have in TensorFlow, MXNet, you can compile it with the AWS Neuron compiler so it can actually run on these AWS Inferentia chipsets. And then you have flexibility of choice how you deploy it out. By the way, all of this is, of course, open source. So you find it on GitHub as the AWS Neuron SDK. So a great way to say I can run machine learning inference at a fraction of the cost. So we talked a lot about the different things that you can do. A variety of different examples of how we are using things in the broader Amazon space uh, and how machine learning models apply there, how computer vision can be used, etc. 
So if you want to get started with your own machine learning uh, journey, um, we can help with things such as, of course, the platform, everything that I've talked about, but also things such as training. Um, I also encourage always to prototype things out. Can you do a quick proof of concept? And we can help you with that so that later on you can really bring these machine learning models into production. Now, how can we help with that? Well, first, if you want to build your team skill, there's some hands-on learning capabilities. By the way, we do also have devices like DeepRacer or, or, Deep, um, or DeepLens. So if you want to do a computer vision at the edge, you have some of these tools that can help out here. Um, we have the Deep Composer for generative AI, if you're interested in generative adversarial networks, etc. But then also the machine learning training and certification as part of our training and certification program. And of course, with training and certification, we partner up with other training companies here. So Coursera, Deep Learning AI, Udacity, edX, many different ways to get started. And of course, I think the first thing is always, you know, talk to anyone in AWS if you want to get started too and say, you know, I just want to learn a bit more and here's some use cases. We're more than happy to point you in the right direction. With that in mind also, we have something called the Amazon Machine Learning machine learning solutions lab. So where we engage directly with customers and look into, can we take some of our Amazon machine learning engineers and help the, uh, bring them in to help together with your engineers to kind of figure out what would be the right solution. So we look at a variety of different machine learning engagements and use cases, and then we help with the ideation all the way through production of that machine learning model that you specifically want to want to build. And by the way, this is a team that is a global footprint, so you can get access to some of our machine learning engineers that are building for the broader Amazon space. Also, we have the machine learning Embark program. So again, have a look at that. Uh, a variety of different cross-functional workshops for you to actually try things out, get hands-on, understand, have I should say in-person training right now, maybe not in person given the current pandemic situation, but still with an actual instructor um, and hopefully in the future, again, also in classroom uh, training that's uh, available for you. Like I said, for the development, we have the machine learning solutions lab available. And if you want to engage, you know, get hands on with things like ePraise or DeepLens, really great ways to get started. Um, so in summary, um, again, always think about working backwards from a business outcome. That's always what we want to drive from, but tap onto AWS, the different frameworks, the different services that we have, our entire partner network to say, to quickly iterate and build, prototype out your machine learning models, improve them over time, use platforms such as SageMaker to roll things out quickly, but also look at some of the fully managed AI services that are available. So always start there so that it's our uh, it's our responsibility to con constantly improve and train, build these machine learning models. But if that is not sufficient, you can use things such as SageMaker. And again, we are agnostic to the frameworks that we're using. We're constantly looking into reducing uh, the cost and make it more cost effective for you to build your own machine learning models with new chipsets and new underlying infrastructure. So that's all I have for today. Uh, you can always feel free to visit ml.aws if you want to read up a little bit more on what uh, what we do around machine learning and get started with some of the things that I talked about. Hope that was insightful. And you know, if there's any feedback or comment, please just reach out to me. More than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much for your attention.